concussion may are always a shaking of your brain tissue inside the skull bone, but it doesn't say where you have hurt yourself in most of the cases. If you've purchased or looked at buying a new helmet over recent years, there's a chance you would have seen something called MIPS. MIPS, if you aren't aware, is a product that was launched in 2007 and has since sold over 9 million of their devices. But what is MIPS? What is it designed to do and how was it developed? I've been invited out here to Sweden to find out exactly that. As cyclists, most of us have had, or may have in the future, a crash, and that includes myself. We may experience what is referred to as a concussion. The symptoms of concussion are visible, but what does having a concussion actually mean? What really does it look like inside the brain? To find out, we spoke to Hans, a neurosurgeon and co-founder of MIPS. Concussion, uh, that is a general word for shaking the brain tissue inside the skull. Uh, concussion means a lot of things, but you have to be aware of the fact that around 80% of the concussions are mild, while 10% is moderate and the rest is severe head injuries. All these categories are included in concussion. So when you get an answer from your colleagues or whatever that you have received a concussion, it doesn't say so much. Concussion may or always a shaking of your brain tissue inside the skull bone, but it doesn't say where you have hurt yourself in most of the cases. Now, if you go with a mild, head injury due to a concussion and do a, a perform a CT scan or MRI scan, then you probably don't see anything. However, if you have a moderate to severe head injury that is also a concussion, then you will see lots of things. But that the vast majority of concussions are uh, due to mild head injury, which you cannot define. That's how I would look upon it. I'm now joined by Peter Holden, the co-founder of MIPS, who I'm going to ask a few tough questions to, hopefully, and find a few answers that I don't yet know. No. So, Peter. Talk to me about how MIPS started. Where, what was day one? What did that look like? Well, we, it all started when I first met with uh, Hans von Holst, the brain surgeon, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to start a PhD. Um, and um, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do that, but I told Hans that, uh, well, I gave it a try. And we start reading about the anatomy in the human head and the brain. Well, uh, Hans already knew about that, but I didn't. So. I said to Hans, so maybe we can use the safety system that we have in our head and the brain, where the brain can slide inside of the skull in the cerebrospinal fluid. So, and Hans said, well, I think that's a great idea. So we started to work around that idea and figure out if it could be possible to use it in a helmet. And at that time, we didn't really know so much about helmets, how helmets are tested or how you fall, uh, fall from a bicycle or a motorcycle. Uh, but looking into real accident situations, looking into how um, helmets are tested today. Helmets are tested only for a pure vertical drop, measuring only the linear acceleration. And we understood quite uh, uh, at once that, uh, well, we had something great in this idea which could reduce the rotational uh, forces otherwise transmitted to your brain, as the brain is more sensitive to rotation and you get this rotation when you fall at an angle to the ground. So it was kind of putting pieces to pieces together in a puzzle uh, with the information uh, that I just told you about. And from that we understood that there is a big, uh, great idea and we can probably make a big change and reduce the number of injuries. 
You've mentioned today something called rotational motion, which is a phrase I've never heard before. What exactly is rotational motion and how is the device that you've created and designed reducing the injuries that are caused by that? I think uh, to understand rotation, uh, you can take the boxer, for example. They can stand hitting each other round after round with a straight hits yep. and then suddenly they will get an uppercut, they get the rotation and then that's when they are knocked out. So the human head and the brain is much more sensitive for this rotation than a linear motion, kind of. So what we have done within the MIPS uh, helmet is when, when you fall to the ground at an angle, uh, the helmet will grab into the ground and you get the rotation of the helmet and as the, the forces are so high, the helmet will transmit this rotation to the head. What we do in the MIPS uh, uh, helmet is that we have a sliding layer that can move in all directions, 10 to 15 millimeters. So what happens is that we are mimicking actually that you fall on ice. So if you fall on ice, the head will just continue in the direction it was supposed to go instead of uh, grabbing in and rotate. And that is what we have in the sliding layer. So we have a very low coefficient of friction uh, surface here between this layer and the helmet. And then uh, we redirect the energy from rotation to translation. And that's how we reduce the rotational uh, motion to the head and the brain. So how long has it taken to finalize the design that you're currently using? And are you constantly developing for new designs going forwards? Or is this now the design that's going to work forever? We still uh, develop new systems. We still learn about uh, head injuries. Um, concussion, for example, is an injury which is just a name for a symptom. Still, there's a lot of research to be made to understand exactly what is damaged into the brain. Uh, but the only thing we know today is that concussion and other severe brain injuries are caused by this rotational motion of, of the head. And what we actually do, the only thing we do in the, with the MIPS helmet and the, the different MIPS products is that we re reduce the rotational energy transmitted to the brain. So it's still if we don't are, uh, exactly know on what kind of force I need to hit you with to get, for you to get a concussion, we know that less uh, impact is better for, for your head and the brain and that is what we're doing in the MIPS uh, helmet. I'm not quite sure if I should describe this room as a test lab, as an office space, or as a multifunctional gym room, because look at this. They've got everything you could ever need to work out at MIPS, which I'm guessing they do in their lunch breaks. You've got the weight bench, you've got some sort of stepper machine, row machine. In there, there are loads of balance boards and gym balls, loads of cords, and then the important bit, which is all the bikes. They've got another room over there, which is full of mountain bikes as well, a couple of spin bikes as well. And then when you finish working out at MIPS, there's a really cool room where you've got to go to. There's only one place to go, that's the massage room. It's two minutes to four, so I'm a little bit early for my four o'clock appointment. But I can't wait to have a massage. Down there is the MIPS Global Test Center, and I'm gonna go down and meet the head of product development, Marcus Seifert, who's gonna talk me through the product testing protocol, and he's also gonna demonstrate exactly how it works. And apparently, he's gonna be using a head which bears an uncanny resemblance in shape and size to mine. Right, I'm in the test lab now, and I'm joined by Marcus I, who is head of product development. I'm calling Marcus Marcus I, because he's one of five Marcuses here at MIPS. And you're going to talk us through the test protocol, how you test the helmets, and you're going to show us a few tests, aren't you? Yeah, yep. Uh, so we're at the uh, MIPS headquarters in Stockholm. This is the Aldo test rig that we're using whenever we test helmets for production and approval. Uh, we also use it for uh, creating new products, of course. Uh, and I'll just show you yes. a couple of the tests. Uh, quickly, uh, what we're testing for is rotational. So uh, we're testing towards an angled anvil, a 45 degree anvil. Uh, a bike helmet, we're testing at three different impact locations. Uh, we're testing it, uh, if my hand is the animal, we're testing it in this uh, test point, which is the front, uh, to make sure that the, the MIPS, which is uh, omnidirectional, can move in all uh, directions, but we're making sure that it's 
moving freely in this direction by this test. Uh, we're testing in, in this direction, uh, which we call is the lateral. Of course, testing that the MIPS brain protection system mo moves in this direction. And then finally, we tested in, in a, what we call pitched impact, uh, pretty much a head on crash. Uh, the sort of thing you'd see in real life. Exactly. Uh, so, an impact in this location of the helmet uh, where uh, most of the cycling uh, accidents, I would say, uh, happen. Okay, can I pick up your test head? Because I remember from a sure. minute ago, this thing weighs a ton. Yeah. Apparently, it's the size, well, it is the size. It's a 58 centimeter head, this one, isn't it? Which is my actual head size. And it's meant to be actual weight as well. Yeah. In which case, I can't believe how strong my own neck is because yeah. that, that is not light, is it? Yeah, it's uh, 4.2 kilograms. Right. Uh, we have different test heads for different uh, helmet sizes. So, of course, we have a medium size, we have a child size, uh, extra large size as well. Yeah. Uh, all equipped with the uh, accelerometer system inside of them uh, to gather the data, but also uh, a gyro to make sure that we have the helmet position correctly before uh, setting up every test. Okay, right, I'll give you that. Okay, uh, you can place it inside of the helmet. Uh, so, when we test, we try and have it as you would use the helmet normally. So, you would tighten the chin strap. I mean, I wouldn't. Comfortable? <laughs> you wouldn't? I have mine very comfortably. <laughs> yeah, okay. Tapping around down there okay. somewhere. Uh, position it. Uh, so that the uh, nose to the rim of the helmet is in a good way, uh, normal. Uh, we would have this small tool to make sure that it's the correctly aligned according to the specifications of the helmet. Uh, every helmet actually has a specification for that distance. Okay. Uh, once that's done, uh, fit system tightened securely, put it in the test rig, and the test rig would know from my scanning what height, what impact location, and everything. Yep. The instrumentation has a, a connection to this application that tells us what's the actual location of the head. So that when testing, uh, we can have the exact same setup uh, when testing the original helmet and the MIPS version of the helmet. Uh, once I have the readings, the numbers that I would like it to have, I just put the lever on that keeps the uh, head in place and the helmet in place during a uh, during the free falling part uh, before the impact, the lever releases just 50 centimeters above the, the, uh, the anvil. Right. Uh, then I'm good to go, off to the computer, press uh, the button to uh, raise it up and then uh, drop it. Right, so the test was over there and then the results are here, is that right? Yes, so uh, all the test data uh, zoom through the cable to the computer and then uh, onto this program. So basically what we see here is the linear uh, accelerations and uh, as you see on the video, uh, it's the slow-mo from the, from the impact. So um, this is a thousand frames per second slow-mo, uh, we could, and do it frame by frame if we would like to, do a quick analysis, uh, also compare the uh, two versions side by side uh, and all that. Okay. And uh, uh, on, in the graph there, you could see the um, yellow, green, and white uh, lines are the different X, Y, Z parameters. And between these lines, uh, it's five milliseconds. So as you can see, that's uh, quite a short amount of time. Yeah, considering it takes 100 milliseconds to blink. Exactly. Roughly. That's the impact over before you even realize it's happened, basically. Yeah, yeah. so uh, basically, the, it's, uh, it's a very short amount of time that you have to potentially save your life. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this impact would be uh, over in maybe eight milliseconds. Uh, I can show you some other uh, um, parts of this as well. We could see the angular acceleration uh, and the angular velocity. Uh, same components that you have, uh, the green, white, and yellow. Uh, the angular velocity is what we see correlate to strain and the uh, tearing of the brain tissue, mostly. Yeah. And it's exactly that that the MIP system is designed to eradicate, isn't it? Exactly. So uh, this number uh, would be the, the peak or the combination, uh, what we look at in, into comparing the MIPS and the non-MIPS helmets. And you can see that the, for the MIPS helmets, you would have a, a lower uh, 
value. Okay. A minute ago, you mentioned that when you've done many, many tests like you have here, you start to notice that a non-MIPS helmet sounds different, but also that you actually have to catch the helmet in a different way, that it, it bounces much higher up in the air. It's yeah. no longer a low catch because exactly. the energy is being absorbed. The energy is still within the helmet and it's still being fired off somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. I mean, since we're basically redirecting energy, uh, the slip plane uh, that MIPS uh, is, is uh, you get the energy instead of you get a high bounce. You get yeah. So not only would you feel it in your head if you had the accident, you'd also visibly see it that it's been less severe, the energy has been absorbed by yeah. your system. Yeah, exactly. Do you think there's enough information and education out there about the effects of concussion and the brain injuries that rotational motion can cause? The most important is that people wear a helmet so, I mean, the, that is definitely the most important that you, you have a helmet when you're riding a bike, even if you're riding just to work or a short distance. Uh, we can see that most accidents uh, or a lot of accidents occur just for this short, uh, when you just are going to the store buying uh, whatever uh, to put on the helmet. I'm wearing a helmet every day. It's uh, like when you put a safety belt in the car. It's a natural thing for, for me. In other countries in Europe, helmet use are not that frequent as maybe we have in Sweden. Uh, but when you understand how sensitive the human head and the brain is, then of course you want to have a helmet and you want to have a safe, as safe helmet as possible. Uh, as helmets are tested today for pure vertical impact, that is not how you fall. You fall at an angle and you can get the rotation and we know that the brain is much more sensitive for the rotational motion. So therefore hopefully Helmets will uh, improve uh, in the coming 10 years uh, and hopefully most helmets will, will have a rotational protection system in there. When it comes to choosing a helmet for myself, I base it on a few things. I base it on the aesthetics of the helmet. How does it look when I'm wearing it? How comfortable is it? Is it lightweight? Is it well ventilated? I've certainly never really stopped to consider, is it actually protecting my head? Because I always just assumed that a top of the range helmet was doing just that. And I've definitely never for one second thought about rotational motion because it wasn't something I'd ever heard of until today. But going forwards, I now understand that it's really this that's causing the damage to our brains when we do have one of these accidents. This snow globe simulates rotational motion transmitted to the brain, and most helmets are tested with a vertical drop test like this. If you look inside the snow globe, you'll see the snow hasn't moved. Imagine that's now your brain matter, and you start to factor in angular velocity, such as we experience when out on our bikes. And it's then that you start to see the impact of such a crash or an accident. And that's why the MIP system has been designed, is to limit the effects that this is having and to prevent brain injuries. If you learned something today, give this video a thumbs up. And for more videos right now, click just down there.